Welcome to Miss Dear Creations. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Irving Finkel of the British Museum. He is the curator of the Mesopotamian artifacts exhibit at the museum, and I'm very glad to have him here. How have you been doing? Well, I'm I'm fine, and all my family's fine. Um, the British Museum is only partly open to the public and the staff um, are not working in the building. So okay. I haven't been in the museum on a daily basis since the February before last, which is oh, unbelievable because for all of my entire life, I've been in the museum most of my life, most days of my life. So it's quite peculiar. I'm what they call working at home, which means answering letters. Okay inquiries as much as possible and um writing as well so excellent well uh it's a little bit of a break uh but yes it is it's for the wrong reasons but in point of fact um not having to go into town every day is um, very beneficial and i have been able to complete a manuscript um which it combined with going to work every day, Monday to Friday, would have been very difficult. But I've had quite a long run of uninterrupted time, so I've just finished it off, which is great. Sent it off, in fact. Excellent. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and what you do? Well, with, with pleasure. Well, I'm a curator in the British Museum, and I've been there for most of my adult life. So I was born in 1951. So on my next birthday, I discovered to my horror, I'm going to be 70 years old. And um, I'm still on the staff of the museum. I think they've forgotten how old I am. So with a bit of luck, I can keep going. But I decided when I was about nine or ten that I really wanted to work in the British Museum because I always found it very fascinating. And I was most fortunate that the way my life unfolded, that it became possible. Because when I went to university, I ended up studying the ancient writing of Mesopotamia, that's to say cuneiform writing, had a very brilliant professor and I had to learn Sumerian and Babylonian both and I worked with him for three years and then um, when I got my degree I did a PhD with him and then I went to America for three years and had a position in the University of Chicago and then I got the job in the British Museum. So I've had a very um, fortunate career, not months and years being unemployed in a very esoteric subject it was just very good fortune so my job in the bm is i'm one of the curators um, in the middle east department and my job is to read inscriptions in these languages sumerian and babylonian which are written on clay tablets so these clay tablets are not something that most people run into very often if they had a good teacher at junior school they might have told them about hieroglyphs and the other early writing before the alphabet but on the whole cuneiform is not as well known in the world as it jolly well ought to be but it's a fantastic thing because it's the oldest kind of writing um it got up and running by 3000 bc so more than 5,000 years ago, probably before 3000 BC, in southern Iraq, where the first inscriptions that we discover belong to these people, the Sumerians, who you've been asking me about. So the landscape is um, ancient Iraq, what the Greeks called Mesopotamia. And Mesopotamia means between the rivers. And the name is very appropriate because the landscape is that which falls between the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. It's that landscape which is south, hot and barren and desert, and yet it's irrigated, and in the north, more lush and green, especially in the springtime. So this large area of land is the place where, as far as we know, and of course you always have to put that bit in, where writing um, started off sometime before 3000 BC. And when we look at the earliest inscriptions at all, they are pictures. And gradually there was a process whereby pictures were reassigned or reutilized to express sound as well. So they could draw something and after a while they could write syllables and then they wrote all their words in syllables, not like an alphabet, but in syllabic spelling. 
and they developed a proper writing system and the Sumerian language is the oldest language um, of which we know anything in the history of the world because it was lucky that this writing system when it started off in this landscape it was the Sumerians who um, knocked it into shape and used it to write their language so it's a funny looking script and the tablets are all made of clay so they didn't write on wood or paper or skin at least not very regularly and this clay was used to take impressions so they wrote with a thing like a chopstick and they made their signs by pressing the end into the clay and they developed a beautiful writing system which looks quite strange if you've never seen it before and it's certainly not as easy as the english alphabet but it became possible to write the Sumerian language and then the Babylonian language and then many others afterwards so it was a proper writing system so from about 2000 or about 3000 BC we know increasingly more about the Sumerians and they were an early population in ancient Iraq in Mesopotamia we don't know for certain who might have been there before them because that's all in remote prehistory with no records so when we get the first records we meet the sumerians and it's quite an exciting meeting because they are the first human beings that we can as it were talk to we can read what they wrote we can to some extent share their ideas we can find out what they were frightened of what they understood it's quite remarkable with this strange looking writing system which is quite complicated on pieces of clay we have a sort of opportunity to dial in from the long time afterwards and listen to them and um, interrogate them in our minds even if we can't speak to them now one of the things about the sumerians which is really very important is this that their language and we know quite a lot about it their language does not have any modern relatives so when we get to the babylonian language there are lots of relatives because it's part of a big family group but the sumerian language is a kind of bubble in isolation and this is rather significant you see when you know anything about languages in the modern world you soon find out that some languages are related to others so if you do latin at school and then you have to learn spanish french or italian then um, you're halfway there because the language is developed similarly the grammar works in a rather similar way often the vocabulary is familiar and so forth so when you put all the languages of the world on a large sheet of paper they more or less all fall into one or other language group there are some tricky ones around the edge but more or less it's a general rule now the thing about sumerian is whatever anybody might say it has no modern relatives at all and a relative can be a sister or a cousin or a cousin twice removed or something like that but it doesn't even have a twice removed cousin type of relative it's on its own so this meant that when the script began to be deciphered the sumerian language which is what came out of it was very very obscure indeed to the first people who encountered it and something very fortunate happened which is this that the same writing the same cuneiform was not only used to write sumerian at the outset but very soon afterwards the second language of iraq which is called akkadian now akkadian um, is an obscure term to most people but you can imagine the name Assyrian and Babylonian the Assyrians in the north and the Babylonians in the south they spoke this language Akkadian and Akkadian is related to modern tongues because it is from the Semitic group so if you know Arabic or Ethiopic or Aramaic or hebrew any of those modern tongues if you look at akkadian texts you know where you are you recognize something so this okay. is the, the crucial point to answer your question is all we know about the sumerians is due to the things that the babylonians 
wrote in the same writing about the language. They translated Sumerian into Babylonian. They made lists of words from one language to another. And all those things that they did for their own purposes were what opened up the Sumerians to modern scholarship. Excellent. Um, so uh, basically the 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 kind of uh, shared the language so they, they could basically speak to each other in yes. Sumerian uh, yeah. as well as to uh, to record things that uh, have significance to the Sumerian language that they want to convey. Yeah. That's exactly right. You see, the two stocks of people, which is the best way of referring it, the, the, the Sumerian persons and the Semitic per persons who came in, in different waves into the landscape, they lived symbiotically. They lived in harmony. There was no racial tension between the Sumerians and the Babylonians. Never. There's never anything like that. The two tongues interlocked. When you went to school, if you were from that sort of family and you were going mm. to become a scribe, you had to learn Sumerian if you didn't know it, or you had to learn Babylonian if you didn't know that. And all the texts that you read compared the two languages. You learned the vocabulary in both languages and you learned to write things in both languages. You studied the classics. So what happens mm. is this, that always there's a group of persons in the country who are not only educated as you might say about people today, they were very well educated and they knew their Sumerian and their Babylonian languages properly. And they even studied the grammar. And this might be surprising, but we know that in the schools, if you were a Babylonian boy and you had to read a myth about the love goddess Inanna and what happened to her, then the teacher, you would read some lines in Sumerian and then you'd have to explain what does this verb mean? How do you know what it means? And they were encouraged and in fact obliged in the classroom to parse words, to explain them to the teacher, just as used to be common in school here. I mean, I don't think it's quite the same, but people of my grandfather's age, when they went to school, they had to study Latin. Often they had to study Greek. And when they yeah. read Julius Caesar, they had to show the teacher they understood the grammar properly. And that doesn't happen much in the world anymore, but it happened already. Mm. You no, know, it's a completely different thing. It's a bit sad, I think. Yes, it is. Uh, I think we've we've lost uh, a lot of uh, our our way with with language uh, since uh, since the early early 1900s uh, alone. Uh, we've lost many. The, the capability to uh, learn language easily. Yeah. I myself, myself even, uh, I I want to to learn. I, want, I actually want to learn Sumerian to be able to speak it fluently uh, as kind of a secret language between my wife and I. Well, that's a good idea. Let me tell you something that Sumerian has been extinct since about the time of Jesus. So it lasted for three thousand years. In cuneiform writing, there were still people who studied Sumerian in the first century BC, like yeah. Achaean. But eventually, Aramaic, Greek and Aramaic took over from the ancient languages and the cuneiform writing system became extinct. So there, if you do learn Sumerian with your wife, you will be the only two people who can converse with one another because the language is otherwise extinct. Now, the thing is. We know a lot of vocabulary. We know a lot about the grammar. We can read their texts fairly well unless mm. they're very complicated. But when you study this language, um, it hardly gives you words you would need for conversation. So if you wanted to say cool or um, no idea or how are you doing and things like that, it would be quite difficult to find from what we know of Sumerian how they might have done it. Although once in a while, you can have an idea. But the important thing is this, that the language is a real proper language, that it has an extensive vocabulary and the scribes who wrote it could certainly explain things or to convey things with irony or humour or other things like that, even if for us, sometimes these voices, these subtleties are not clear. You see, in the Babylonian tongue, 
we really understand Babylonian or Akkadian as it's called inside out so if somebody writes a letter in Akkadian you can tell whether they're being servile or sarcastic or two-edged or something because the way the language is used we can respond to it much more clearly than the Sumerian where often the grammar is not fully clear I'll tell you why Sumerian as a tongue is one of the hardest to learn not only because of the writing and because it's dead and because it's so far away but because of mm. itself because it is what linguists call agglutinative which is to say you don't have like we do a sentence with subject object verb adjectives and adverbs tucked in the middle of the sentence as separate words you don't tend to have quite the same thing because it's the verb that is the odd matter so when you want to say um, he, the, the, the Gilgamesh opened his mouth and spoke to Enkidu in the Cajun, it's very clear in Sumerian, the spoke to, it, you have the word dog, which means to, or do, which means to speak. And you have to tuck in front of it a whole string of special syllables which convey meaning and also uh, after it you have to tack things on the end so these will tell you who's speaking the subject whether it's in the past whether it's causative whether it okay. had happened and all that and they're all squidged together in one long verb so when okay. you when you meet it what you of course when you speak it naturally then it's easy but for us you have to disentangle that this bit means ah oh, there's a, a masculine a subject and this bit means he, to him and why there and over here and all that and you have to you have to kind of squeeze out a bit bit by bit it's a bit like reading something from another planet it is not okay. it's not instinctive whereas if mm. you look at Babylonian you know um I'll give you an example about that that okay. my friend Jeremy Black um, who was a very very close friend of mine when he was a student in Oxford when they'd learnt the signs they were asked by the teacher to translate the first chapter of Pride and Prejudice into Akkadian they had to find the words and transpose the sentences into Babylonian language and they did it they, of course it wasn't a way that would have pleased Jane Austen but at least it can the narrative whereas if you try to do that with Sumerian it will be very very much more difficult so if you are going to learn it it's a very romantic idea to share this yeah. together it may take you quite a long time and you may lose a lot of weight in the process and I dare say once in a while you might think about giving up but you must persevere and and uh, ball through uh, would you say that Sumerian is uh uh, they would convey uh, Im uh, an understanding of images in the language Certain as well. Certainly, you mean using images, for example, in, in, images as 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 the ver use a, a description of an image as as a verb in the well, sentence. Well, they could do, for example, um, they made a lot of analogies with the animal world. So um, if you have an epithet of a, of a hero who's brave as a lion and fierce as a bull, and and, and you can say fierce as, as, as a prancing bull and, and wild as a savage lion. I mean, they have all this sort of vocabulary. Yes, absolutely. So they saw the world, um, as far as we can tell, like we do. They had possibly less colours than we do. Um, in our vocabulary this is a very complicated matter but in um in in uh, even in babylonian or in akkadian we're not sure how many colors they had because um yellow and green are conveyed by one name so they had they certainly had black and white and red um and blue but whether the, whether they had more colours than that, or whether, this is a difficult thing because the texts that have these words, it's a, for example, they're talking about the colour of wools, wool dyes. It's devilishly complicated to understand um, whether that really does give good information or not about the colours. But in point of fact, you know, they lived in a, a landscape at the mercy of nature. Um, when it, 
when it was hot it was hot when it flooded it flooded when it rained it rained and they early early learned the sumerians um, who lived in the south of iraq which had very dry arid parts and also the marshes further south where it was awash with water and people lived there as well they learned how to control the rivers or to take offshoots from the rivers to irrigate dusty landscape which would then produce fruit and vegetables in abundance so this they discovered this very early so their their fortunes were made in this respect because they could always produce more than they needed which um, enabled them to um, to bargain to deal for things that they didn't have themselves and, and trade routes existed from a very early period and textiles from all the wool uh, were traded in the north for metals like tin and copper which they didn't have and stone was brought from afghanistan in exchange for something else so the world in which they lived was not like primitive and simple and everybody going ah oh, walking about like on a farmyard but they, they had leaders they had priests they had literate persons they had thinkers they had people who observed the heavens and thought about it they had people who wondered about how the world came to be and what everything meant just like we do even though the texts in which things are written don't correspond to fluent um, theses like malcolm muggeridge or aristotle or somebody would write in a philosophical vein but when you look at the sumerians um when you meet them when you hear them um many many things about them show that homo sapiens then and homo sapiens now are closely related and although there are peculiar things about the sumerians sometimes it might be not so much that they were peculiar as that we don't fully understand things now there is yeah there is one jolly tricky thing about the sumerians which has caused people once in a while to um to have a bit of a hesitation you see um, before mesopotamia was ever united under one dominant king the landscape in the south in sumer where the sumerians lived um, was formed of a group of more or less completely independent city states which were large and rambling with people in charge usually a major temple and a priesthood and people working and trading and doing things on behalf of the city in which they lived it was like that and um sir leonard woolley who excavated um, so famously at the city of or in southern iraq in the 1920s with the university of philadelphia and um, baghdad museum they did a joint expedition and they found a cemetery in or which they knew was the center of something like an empire already because the kings of Sumer were very powerful and their inscriptions have been found in a wide range of areas showing they controlled um, at certain periods quite a wide empire and they found a cemetery in which some of the kings from about 2500 bc or something kings and queens they found the royal burials and the thing there was that the royalty were laid out but all around them were their courtiers and the okay. musicians and the guards and the the young ladies in waiting and all these people who'd served them in their life were all laid out dead um, next to them in the cemetery when they were buried so okay. this was a very strange thing to encounter because it is very counterintuitive not a very healthy idea well if that's the way they behave they must be a whole bunch of weirdos and we need to look at them from a long distance away that they're not like us at all but the thing is this um i have a feeling that there was a reason for it and that, 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 that there was a while when it was a tradition and then it stopped and everybody said why are we doing this it's crazy and and it came to an end and it never happened again thereafter and they don't quite what happened to the people because some people think they were drugged and uh some people think they might have been dead already but i don't see how they all can have been dead already and some people had the back of their heads bashed in so it was a bit confusing how they did it but all the same i think if you were um, 
had a nice job in the palace and looking after the chariot for the ruler and feeding the horses and everything and then the king gets ill and dies and they tell you well that's the end of you as well you probably feel a bit irritated i mean i wouldn't be very happy about that so <laughs> nor would i so so this is one of the weirdo things about the sumerians how could they do that well there's no clear answer but of course when you look at human beings when you look at their record if you expect them to be rational and sensible and considerate, loving and good persons, they very seldom are for long. And all nations have episodes in their past, which, when you look at them now, seem very, very weird or worse. So we just have to say that they had their reasons and they fulfilled this idea until it stopped. But when you look at letters and business arrangements and um, law cases you know someone didn't pay what they were owed they go in front of a sort of magistrate and they take a witness statement and they argue it out and they impose a punishment all these sorts of things running along show that their society was familiar to us and if we'd landed in a rolls royce and opened the door and gone through the city gate we wouldn't think we were in some other part of another galaxy but that these were human beings and there'd be people who had more children than they wanted and they were all rather undernourished and there'd be fat people who ran good market businesses and made a lot of money and there'd be kings and drunkards and prostitutes and all the stuff that you have in groups of people just like that then we'll be right back back to the show what you're just describing actually reminds me of uh, of the dynasties of uh, china yes uh and particularly one one uh, famous uh, guy, I, I'm actually forgetting his name right now. He uh, he had a bunch of terracotta statues built instead of uh, killing off his entire court. Uh, yeah. He had terracotta statues representing all of them made so that he could take his court with him when he passed away. Right. But the implication is that it's an earlier time. Very yeah. pro- they took all the pe- 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 the actual people and you know it's the same in egypt because in the in the pre-dynastic period that's before the first dynasty before the great pharaohs of, of that time um there are graves that show that retainers were buried in the same way in egypt this is very ancient times and um, what happened in in the end was that they made these things called shabkis. You know, in museums, you often see things like little little mummies, sometimes in yeah. the little mummy case, about a foot high. Well, usually with inscriptions on. Well, they're called shabtis or ushabti. And um, many graves of the of historic period, especially in the New Kingdom, people were buried with boxes of these little chaps. And the idea was that when they were dead and over there, if someone said, well, it's time for your work on the canals, you know, you've got your responsibility, they'd blow a whistle and all these little things would come to life and do the job for them. So in the same way, um, it seems to me clear that that process um, is what in a rational time supplants um, m- murdering all the retainers to accompany the royalty. But actually in Mesopotamia, it just stopped. So where we have, um, there are not many of them, royal graves, there's no suspicion of that, nor are there boxes of little courtiers in miniature either. So I think the phase, such as it was, came and went, and everybody turned their back on it. I can imagine, uh, with uh, with murdering off your entire court, uh, I think a few people will get rather uppity about uh you killing their daughter, their son, their I their would, wife, I think husband. So. I, I would think there'd be an outcry about it. And even yeah. if they were promised, you know, they go straight to the best place they could be. Um, not everybody would believe that. It is a rather mysterious matter. I've often wondered about what it means. And um, so they didn't have the kind of religion where there was a heaven that you'd go to. They didn't have this sort of idea that if you died meritoriously for example you would be rewarded with a happy life in some kind of heaven they didn't have this idea they didn't have okay. it so what the, what was the, their concept of that then well it's a bit if, difficult to tell with the sumerians i mean they had an underworld for certain which they believed to be under the world 
and yeah. people were buried in their graves downwards. And um, the, the idea was that um, the, the body, of course, would fall to pieces and become unpleasant and will be buried sometimes even in the courtyard of the house where people lived. And the ghost, the spirit of the person, would go down into the underworld where it would stay. And the question of how long it would stay or what it would stay for is not clear in Sumerian sources. They don't tell us that. But what we do know is that people were buried um, and they were um, there was a tube usually which led from the top surface down into where a grave was where offering mm. of food and drink were supplied because they felt that ghosts needed this extra sustenance because what they got in the next world was a bit on the thin side and um, when okay. when people especially in the babylonian tradition when people forgot to do this then ghosts would get a bit annoyed and they'd come back and start to um, pulling your hair in the kitchen and say, you know, what about me? And all that kind of thing. So yeah, they had a rather well, natural and rather endearing attitude to ghosts, I think. Yeah. This, this, kind, this kind of brings to mind the Day of the Dead uh, uh, celebrations in, in Mexico area where, where, where in November they, uh, they'll, they'll go and, and, uh, have a meal with their their family uh, as as a way of remembering them. Yes, I think the Sumerians um, d- did that. I think they had an annual celebration of their family dead. I think they, there's some evidence for it. Um, and also, uh, there are a few other interesting little ideas that um, they didn't bury. When someone was dead, there, were, there had to be an interlude where the spirit was allowed to come out of the body and be free of the body. They didn't rush the body into the ground. They knew that um, there had to be a sort of interlude. And it's the, the fact is that we have much more information about the Babylonians and the Assyrians than we do about the Sumerians, because in the third millennium uh, BC, from the time of the writing down to about 2000 BC, from that th- thousand year period, most of the Sumerian inscriptions that we have don't talk about this kind of thing at all. They talk about administration excessively, things for uh, t- tax records and deliveries and uh, payments and all that, loads of information. And there's some laws, there's some um, legal documents and there are lots of royal inscriptions by the kings but there's not much to do with um th- that particular question you asked me there are spells against demons for example and spells against ghosts we have a bit of S- sumerian magic what the kind of things they said um, and like the babylonians thereafter but there's no real treatise about um about the underworld. In fact, I've been collecting all this stuff for my new book, and it's the pictures about the underworld are very um, they're literary and they're very removed from reality. And uh, there's a kind of tradition of of the of the mythological literature about what was to be expected and what actually people buried in their graves, because what they buried in their graves was things that they thought they would need in the world to come, vessels pottery, furniture, jewellery, um, this sort of thing, because they assumed that wherever they went, whatever survived of them was going to go somewhere where they would need all this stuff. So the burial itself does not look like um, the rather grim picture of the netherworld, which comes in later texts, where it's all dark and all the ghosts are hanging about going, making sad faces and they live off um, clay and dust and they just mm. hang about hang about it's really rather gruesome okay um so uh, now that we're on the subject of magic how um, actually i'm going to backtrack for a second there um the the re- i i think the reason why there'd be so many uh scripts about manuscripts about uh, the work in inner workings of the society is because if you think of it, uh, the amount of paperwork today, even for my own business, uh, it's a lot of paperwork, and and you end up with stacks of paperwork 
that uh, where, where you're using clay tablets to write this stuff down, that would be the more likely to uh, to actually survive to modern day because there's just so much of that. Well, this is a, a, a remarkable thing that um, clay, which you would think would not be a very good medium for writing, actually is a perfect medium for what they did because they impressed their signs into the clay, and they it was they were dried in the air usually. Um, mm. Sometimes they were fired in a kiln. But the thing about them is they're more or less indestructible. And um, wherever people have dug in Mesopotamia, unless they've been very unlucky, they found lots of tablets. So we have a good idea of, this, of what things were written about and what weren't. And um, on the whole, um, it's true both of the Sumerians and also the Babylonians who came next to and after them, because most of the writings we have are um, from the Babylonians and the Assyrians. They... Um, they, their, one of their great strengths, intellectual strengths, was collection of data because mm. they started off collecting all the signs when the signs were invented and all the words when they realised that a language had words. They collected all the words in both languages. That became a very big operation. And they sorted them out into categories of things like made of stone or made of wood or the names of gods or this or that. They, they were very good at the systematic collecting of data and they collected data in a medical sense, um, in the observation of the body and phenomena about the body and recipes were all collected and omens, especially where they predicted the idea was to predict the future. They they took omens for things that happened by accident, like um, uh, um, a tile falling off the roof and landing on your toe or um, the things they did on purpose. They, they they had operations to try and get an answer, like okay. put incense into a fire. And there were thousands and thousands of lines of these omens that say, if such and such a thing was observed, then such and such a thing is to be expected. They linked one event with another. So they had a huge corpus of these kinds of things, all sorted out by the librarians into very clear patterns. And only occasionally do you find an inscription where a very clever scribe, probably at the latter part of his life, is asking himself questions about the omens and how they work. But there's only a handful of bits where you can um, hear the voice of someone who's thinking um, analytically, on the whole, they propagated this investigation, they collected the data and they sorted it out, but they didn't go for synthesis or for abstract theory. And that, of course, is what the Greeks did, because um, they were very um, um, sharp in the area of abstraction and theory. And in fact, the, the, the important thing that took place at the end of the cuneiform period, say from the third century BC, um, after Alexander the Great, when there were Greek Greeks in Babylonia, um, there's some evidence that the Greek minds, Greek intelligence, intelligentsia were in Babylon, and in fact, even communicating with the scribes of Babylon, learning some cuneiform and using their resources, which passed just at the time when this long 3,000 years of cuneiform law, L-O-R-E law, I mean, was about to vanish. Some of its findings and some of its essence passed into Greek and has now even lasted into our own world. So, for example, one of the most compelling pieces of evidence is this, that the Sumerians first and then the Babylonians after them um, they had very sophisticated mathematics from 5,000 years ago. They could jiggle around really big numbers. They were very clever with numbers. And uh, the, the Sumerian thinkers who, who, who worked on these systems, they preferred to think sexagesimally rather than decimally. So in other words, we work with 10, the number 10, usually because most people have 10 fingers, well, 10 digits on each, their two yeah. hands. And this is a very convenient thing when you're a kid for counting one, two, three, four, five and all that. So I mean, you can understand why the decimal system is embedded in the evolution of mathematics. But at the outset, yeah. they preferred the number 60. 
and okay. of um, observations of astronomy and predictions astronomical and calculations were done with the base 60 and this actually is still intelligible because when the Greeks were in Babylon one of the things they were interested in was medicine and the other one was astronomy and the Babylonians had all this data of the first and last visibilities of such and such a planet and the lengths of eclipses and the, the cycle of eclipses and they could predict eclipses and many many other mathematical matters they had a model of the heavens in their mind with the ecliptic and the movement of the planets and the it, um, it wasn't just like a boy scout with a telescope they had a very very sophisticated understanding of mathematical astronomy and this was food and drink for the greeks and they i can imagine adopted they took over i believe in a harmonious way because i'm sure the greeks um, they didn't steal from the babylonians i think when these savants arrived on a on a greyhound bus from athens in babylon and went to the what we might call the university and they met their equivalents they probably were very excited to meet one the other and explain what they knew and what they did and the greeks brought back a lot of mathematical data couched in 60s and that okay. is why we have 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour today and 360 degrees in a circle that is the survival of the Sumerian babylon mm. counting in 60s which went into greek papyri into ink in greek and lasted down to the modern world i mean that's quite an interesting thing that's uh, a, a trace right right from sumerian to modern day yes that's that's wonderful <laughs> of course if you if you um if you say to a group of school children if you look at the watch on your wrist you'll see and they all put up their hands and say oh i don't have a watch i have a mobile and if you have a mobile then you have a stupid printout dial and you don't have the 60 seconds and the hang going round in the way that the babylonians would have thought was marvelous because that <laughs> was their division of time so now it's all been sliced into nothing so you have to find somebody old with a wristwatch that has all these things on it and then you can tell them or, or a pocket watch like I do. Well, I like have, I love pocket watches. I had one for years, and it was stolen, and I I never got oh. enough. It was a very nice thing. Mm. Um, the one the one that I, I originally had it it was stolen as well. Uh, in the move from Nova Scotia to Victoria. Oh. Uh, yeah, it, it it was a gift from my from my father and and. Very well, sentimental. Oh yes, I know. It's most upsetting for a man to lose his his pocket watch. Well, there a friend of mine knew an American who made a living by selling pocket watches, and and he was very successful at it. And he had a whole load of Victorian pocket watches. When you open them up, you know you could open the face, but you could open the works. Um, yeah. There were some special ones manufactured where the uh, moving parts were attached to figures of a man and a woman so very very gradually these figures move together so that the um in, in a way which in victorian times was presumably regarded as erotic in the modern world nobody would notice it but these <laughs> watches with these special inners were very expensive originally and they are very expensive now so i think this dealer he, he cornered the market and made a awesome money i saw one once it was just amazing and you can imagine these guys with a fat belly after a meal clicking open their watch and everybody's thinking ah he wants to know what time it is but he wants to actually find out how far they got in their movement <laughs> excellent that, that's that's <laughs> i i love that um okay so back to the magic magical elements of the sumerian society um uh, I, I remember watching uh, a YouTube uh, for the British Museum uh, where you were talking about uh, uh, ghosts. Yes. And uh, and uh, they had uh, a thing where you could. Uh, it's a bit of necromancy where you could speak to uh, to a yes. dead relative or or yes. someone I, of importance. That's, that's a, a Babylonian thing. It's from about. Um, about um, 
500 BC. It's not super. The Sumerians didn't, as far as we know. Well, they might have done, but we don't have any evidence. But this tablet with the um, calling up a ghost um, it was written in Babylon in about 500 BC. And it was an interesting thing because you get the skull of the person you want to interrogate and you plunk it on a table with smoke and what have you, incense and this and this. And what happens is there's a magic preparation of a very bizarre kind of oil bits and pieces all mixed up and, and you anoint the skull with mm. this material and then uh the god of the underworld uh, the god of um shamash who, who has a lot to do with ghosts um is supposed to go down to the netherworld and find the person mm. and point them out um so they come up and they go into the skull and then you interrogate the skull with whatever you want to know and it would answer you. So this okay. is a pretty amazing thing to do. I mean, I was astonished when I read this for the first time um, because, you know, the words are one thing. But if you think of the reality, if you get your grandfather's skull out of the backyard and click, dust it off and put it on a silver platter and say grandfather i need to know um, am i going to win the grand national or um, should i do this should i do that um it's that's one thing you obviously have to pay um, a professional um necromancy specialist to conduct everything and to make the mixture and to to recite the words i mean that was all a very very ceremonial very ceremonial thing but also um very costly i imagine and of course if it worked if this skull suddenly started talking i mean everybody would probably be rather frightened would they not so um uh even if they were expecting it it would be quite a shocking thing so i don't know how that happened but um that was certainly um something which was known to the practitioners of magic in mesopotamia and it's something which survived afterwards among in the babylonian talmud there's a reference to this kind of thing even down into the middle ages and later that um which came from babylon that's another thing that survived this necromancy business but you know that's only one side of things and um they had magic uh, against lots of demons and evil to make sure they didn't come anywhere near you or to drive them out or to do complicated rituals to get rid of them and also there was other magic like if you opened a bar or a pub um you'd get one of these guys in to do a whole load of stuff it would prosper yeah i mean let's just say in the modern world now many many places open a restaurant they get a priest or some qualified person to sit in the corner and do something and um slide him a few hundred quid and the restaurant will then profit thereafter it's very <laughs> Yeah. Um, so with uh, with Sumerian society, um, is there any kind of hidden secrets that you can impart upon us that don't usually get out to the public about the inner workings of, of their society? I don't think so. Um, I don't think so. I think they had... Um Well, in the classic time when they had these city states, I, th I think there was some level of um, of communication between them and collaboration between them because there was a kind of state seal in which all the cities had an icon. So, okay. um, although they were there were there were cities that had fights with one another and war with one another, nevertheless they were all Sumerians, and um, I think. Um, the fact that there was that kind of shared feeling um, meant that when it became the time for Sargon of Akkad in the 25th century to, as it were, conquer Mesopotamia and make it into a kingdom, um, that that he managed to do that with a mixture of diplomacy and warfare and started the king of Mesopotamia, king of Sumer and Akkad, king of Babylon, okay. Assyria, which model survived all the way through until the advent mm. of the world when cyrus took over the kingship and the persians were then rulers and so forth all the way through 
yeah so as for secret things with the Sumerians I don't know I think um I, I don't know I mean I, I've looked at a huge amount of material we have many many thousands of tablets in the museum I've read lots and lots of things in Sumerian there's nothing about it which seems to me oh, hello hello what's all this then I don't think so um okay all, um you, you know you had um, a lot of farmers a lot of people in the countryside who couldn't read and write um and that you had the people who became soldiers who couldn't read and write so like with the babylonians later it was pr probably true that the, the writing business and the, the thinking business was sufficiently in the hands of a, a small which kind of limits what you would see of the day-to-day -day life well we uh, some but we don't see enough because i mean all the histories of mesopotamia are concerned with battles and the changes of dynasty and the royal inscriptions and what who who did this and who did that but the the, the, the people in the countryside um you know the ladies in a village who knew about how to deliver babies safely and they knew what to do when you got burnt and how to get a splinter out and something in your eye and all those sorts of people who could repair anything and you know like the, the, the real the people who live a real life in the real world will be the same as anywhere i'm sure and it's true um, we, we know that the there was a um like in many other parts of the world you know they had many gods and goddesses in ancient iraq the sumerians and the babylonians too there, and there were local gods and goddesses so when you had a city state there'd be a big god in charge of it but a small village might have a particularly small god looking out for them so eventually there was a lot of gods and goddesses and sometimes you have an interesting phenomenon in society that the theologians for example um, at the capital in Nineveh um, when they were making god lists um, they tried to make a list of them all because there were so many of them and they amalgamated them when they realized that the, this god of magic from one place was actually the same as Marduk and so they the texts were written to show that um, it's all one god with different names and, and then another thing they did which is rather endearing in my opinion is that they had a theological conceit that the main gods of the pantheon war god and, the, and sun god and storm god and you know the moon and the, the top 10 gods they had households so of course they had a wife and um, sometimes a mistress they had sons and daughters and a tutor to um, teach the children and a groom and someone to do the chariots and um, someone to do the plow share you know and all the people in the court the leather workers they were all the small gods were given jobs in the big courts like the sun god had a huge staff it's really rather amusing and um i suppose that in the main um temples of the sun god offerings and things uh, which were made to the sun god himself must sometimes have included a bit for all the staff and um who were in the background and, and what have you so um i think um it's very easy to get the idea when you read ancient texts that people were um, frightened of evil all the time and they spent their time cowering and hiding behind walls and avoiding demons and um this that and the other but i don't think it's true um, I think that most people live their lives um, with a local folk religion, the local one or two figurines of a local god or goddess, and um, uh, small festivals now and again, and a harvest festival, and, and that sort of activity in the countryside. And they didn't know about all the theology and the big things about the big temple. They had nothing to do with them. And also, people on the whole um, don't worry too much about stuff like that till they get ill when they get ill they get really interested in religion they get really interested in help and that's the same thing so if you were rich you could get a an exorcist to come and drive out the demons which were in your body or save your daughter from dying in childbirth and all the rest of it and if you lived in the countryside where you didn't have any money anyway you didn't know about these people you just got on with it and it's something like that which of course if you think of um, britain before the industrial age must be rather comparable and the people in the village grew up married died in the same village and never traveled more than 10 miles away from where they lived and had no idea um, where big cities were or who was king or, or or where france was or anything like that but they and that that is the uh, um i think the, the sort of picture which is helpful to adopt for the 
looking at the Sumerian world, that it was like that. Yeah. And the people who lived in the capital and had all these dramatic burials and royal inscriptions and that and that, they were the... Um, the elite. The, yeah, they were the elite. They were the minority. And um, uh, and that's how it was. But they had a strong sense of their own importance and their own value because they called Sumer the land. Yeah. You know, they were yeah. headed persons, and they were rather um, aware aware of this thing that they were the Sumerians. I think that, that it wasn't all the time visible, but underneath, I think there'd be a strong feeling of um, something like that. Okay, I'm I'm gonna have a, a rather uh, childlike question here. Uh, what sort of games did they play? Well, um. Uh, they play this game of awe, of course, because uh, we, we know about that, the game of 20 squares. It was in one of the three or four of the royal graves that, that Woolley found they were, when they were buried with all their stuff. They had this game and sometimes the dice and pieces. So this was a race game for two players. And uh, it was, we can see it was popular among the Sumerian elite um, okay. about 1,500 and obviously when you were buried one of the things you want would be this game and then later on like always in the history of games they become democratized and so you find them scratched on bricks and on pavements and um, everybody's playing the game and th that was the main game in mesopotamia all the okay. way through until backgammon was invented um, around the time of the romans so um, l all the way through they played this game of 20 squares what what sort of a game is it? Is it like a strategy game, kind of like chess? No, there was no game no. like chess in antiquity. Um, it's a dice game where you have a track. Um, okay. And seven pieces each, which which are they all have no value like 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 pawns. They're not differentiated. And it's a race round, and they're lucky squares and lucky squares, and the first who gets all the pieces off the end is that sort of game. And it's a game that you can easily, and there's a little bit of strategy, um, because if you um, have a position on the board and you make a throw, it's how you use the throw, which can sometimes be fateful. But it's quite a okay. good game. We've reconstructed it. it. You know, people play it today for pleasure, so it's not surprising. Uh, early, early on, uh, you decoded. Uh, I'm saying decoded. You translated a. A tablet about uh, that called the Ark Tablet. Oh, that yes, yes, yes. Um, and and it kind of describes the building of an ark. It yeah, sure uh, does. But but not but not in in the biblical sense, more in the practical sense of a big flood is coming. I have to build something to protect my people. Yes. Well, the the the, the reason that the humans knew about it, but only only one human knew about it. And um, like Noah, he was instructed by one of the gods to build this ark fast and to put into it male and females of all the animals um, because everything was going to be wiped out, which is um, uh, so he did. And um, it, it, the, the story in the Bible, with which everybody is familiar, of course, derives from a Mesopotamian forerunner, an earlier version of the story. And this this tablet um, contained a, an account written um, in about 1800 BC, so at least a thousand years before the biblical story. Um, the, uh, the, the point was that the, the poet who recorded this part of the story, it's only a section of the story, um, informed us that the Babylonian idea of this boat was a round boat um, and not something like in the Old Testament, which is a sort of long, narrow um, arc, like a bit like a coffin-shaped affair. It wasn't that. It was a round boat. It was a coracle, which is a, a natural round boat that you find on rivers. And in fact, the Mesopotamians had coracles. And in this story, um, the God instructed this Noah-type character to make a round boat um, like a normal one, but gigantic. And um, half the size of a football pitch or whatever it was and to build it and then to put on it male and female 
of all the species so that they could then reproduce after the waters went down. So the thing about it, the remarkable thing about it was, well, there were many things remarkable about it, but one of them was that the description of the style of making this boat as um, contained in this tablet where the god instructed the human being what to do is um, practically speaking what um, people who built coracles on the side of the Euphrates um, in the 1920s AD were still doing it was the same manufacturing mm. system and that's and the numbers were bumped up in proportion um, to make to... it one so somebody worked out that if you make a coracle which is three foot across and you want one which is half the size of a football pitch how much material do you need and everything and they worked it out and when we worked it out backwards it turned out to make a practical craft which is why this mad um, uh, television company decided to build it in india which we did and they made a whole documentary film about it and everything it was rather exciting that that is very exciting um i i love I come come at things from an architectural background, mm. uh, and so any ancient structure I'm very fascinated with. And uh, so that brings me to my next question, which I didn't write down at all. Um, the structures of Samaria, um, how many of those have survived to modern day? Well, um, you, you know what a tell mound is, perhaps. Yes. Yes. Well, the landscape of um, southern Iraq and to some extent the north against the horizon, you see these long, low, high hills, which look high, sort of like low mountains, mm. grass sloping sides are all over the place. And they're called Tell Mounds. And they are, in fact, the site of um, ancient cities. And what what happened in um historically and prehistorically is that in a land like iraq ancient iraq where it was a good moment to live at any point like the junction of a river and a stream or a good pass for the hills or a, whatever reason was ever found to be a desirable spot to live in never altered because it was a feature of the landscape so people okay. lived in the same area, same place, sometimes for thousands of years, and even though it wasn't the same people, so people come and go, and there was warfare, and then the plague, and, and, and God knows all these sorts of things that happen, and the dynastic changes mean some people come and some people go, but the settlements are there, and they're full of um, collapsed archaeology. So when you have a um, an eighteen 50 BC, there's a, an invasion from somewhere and the, the town is sacked and the buildings are set on fire and then eventually everything falls in and the rains come and the earth comes and after a while it's covered over and then somebody else builds on top. And so when you start to excavate down, you can often find superposed one on top of the other, a whole sequence of strata of different periods. And very often mm. there are buildings left in the sense not of a the Eiffel Tower or the Albert Hall, but um, people built in mud brick, and the, the mud brick was made into bricks in in moulds, and they were sun dried, and they were built, and they were very strong um, material. And often the ground plan is still there. Sometimes the walls are still there to four or five feet. I was once on an excavation in in Syria where the walls of the rooms in the central building were four feet high once they'd been emptied. And it was like a building. You could go through the doors and everything. It's amazing. So you have capacity in that part of the world for buildings to survive to a ex remarkable extent. And then, of course, in the middle of Sumerian cities, you often had a thing called a ziggurat, which was a sort of Babylonian answer to the pyramids, if, if you like to look at it that way, which, of course, was made of mud brick, too. And they were absolutely gigantic. They could be seen from miles and miles away. They were... Um, stepped pyramids that, that, that go up um, in order to get as near as possible to heaven and, and some in one case the, the ziggurat at babylon which was gigantic built by nebuchadnezzar um, was taken away bit, brick by brick afterwards when the persians had gone people took the bricks to their houses from so the whole of mountainous building has gone 
that in many parts of Mesopotamia, the remains of these ziggurats are still there. Sometimes they're exposed by archaeology where there's only the bottom courses. And sometimes there's a place called Borsippa where the, 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 the central core of the brick tower is still sticking up out of the ground. So, Wonderful. yes, there are um, dramatic survivals. And um, it's a funny thing that the clay writing is such an alien thing to a modern um, person in our world in, in in their world it was a blessing that they used it because it survives in the ground for untold amounts of time and often tablets come out of the ground as if they've just been written and when their buildings are made of the same material they may suffer and get bashed up but they are still there as well and the archaeologists can sometimes plan a whole city if they have enough money to excavate it they follow the walls and the gates and they follow the house plans and they have streets so the excavations at Ur that Willie published, not only the famous graves that everyone knows about, but he did a whole street plan of Ore and named the streets after the streets in Oxford. And they knew who lived in what house and what was found in the house. And it's it's um, very extraordinary that you can be transported so powerfully into the reality of their lives. It's it's, it's wonderful to be able to uh, to walk into a site like that. Um, uh, in well, in Canada, we don't have near near as much age to our our cities and whatnot. Mm. But uh, we've found some very interesting uh, uh, villages uh, that the only the only trace of it is where the the totem pole uh, was, or or where the pegs to uh, to the teepees actually. Uh, were dug into the ground and and uh, I know that kind of archaeology it's the same in Britain people get mad yeah. excited about a post hole well you dig in the Middle East um, you have a different view of these things but that's just the the um, circumstance of the survivor uh, there, there's uh, sorry sorry about keeping you so long um, uh, just one more question you you spoke about your book that you you just finished uh, uh, what uh, what is what is it and what is it about? Well, it's called the first ghosts, and eh. I, I I realize that um lots of people in the world are interested in ghosts, and there are many many books about ghosts, most of which are nonsense, of course. But there's lots of um books which try to be historical, and people tend to think it all began in the Middle Ages or something. But the Greeks and the Romans had ghosts, and so did everybody else. And the first ones we know about from history are the Babylonian and the Sumerian ones. So I thought I'd write a book about the first ghosts in the world and what they did about them and um, what it tells us about mankind. And I've just finished it and sent it this morning. So I'm waiting for my, my editor to write back and say, uh, or wonderful, and then we'll see. I, I, I hope they allow it through. Uh, I know myself, I, I would buy that. <laughs> <laughs> How long? Good. Uh, excellent. And we'll leave it there. And thank you very much for joining me today. I'm glad it worked out in the end. We were lucky. I didn't think it was going to, but it did. So brilliant. All right. Take care, my boy. And we'll talk one day yes. soon. Okay. Bye bye then. Well, that was my interview with Dr. Irving Finkel. I hope it was as interesting for you as it was for me. He is a great person to talk to and a great presenter. I hope uh, that you look at his lectures on YouTube and visit the British Museum. Please like, follow, and subscribe. We are on all major platforms, including Spotify and YouTube. Please take care.